You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Wyndham Hotels and Resorts makes travel possible for all. Whether it's the long haulers looking for a great cup of coffee, a roomier rest for the on-a-wim road trippers, or a place to make summer memories with the whole family. No matter who you are, where you're going, or why, with 24 trusted brands to choose from like La Quinta, Days Inn, and Super 8, your Wyndham is waiting. Get the lowest price at WyndhamHotels.com. Restrictions apply. Visit website for more details. Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. <laughs> History podcast that's not your history class, with me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. So, before I get into anything else, I, I want to say thank you to everyone who's still leaving reviews, and it's so much fun. It's brilliant. You, you always say such nice things. And here's the thing if you're going to be mean, at least be funny, because otherwise, you're just wasting everybody's time. So, I was at the podcast awards on Friday night. Um, I may have mentioned it once or twice, but I showed up as I promised in pajamas. The photos on my Instagram, you can go have a look at it, comment away. But I did. I wore pajamas to the Irish podcast awards because at the end of the day, if I am not a Sherbert inspired, retro sweet looking person, why bother? We are for dopamine dressing here, and that's just how it is. So, I had such a great time. I was really nervous about going, because one, I'm an anxious person anyway. Because I've got ADHD and an anxiety disorder, so that's fun. And I decided to fly down on my own, and I'm getting to the airport, and it's this wee rural airport, and I had to get a wee bus in. It's not this wee bus, and it's me and a bunch of old aid pensioners. And they're like, are you one of Seamus's lot? I'm like, no, I don't know who Seamus is. I'm not entirely sure I know Seamus. Well, I know one Seamus, but he's an old man who's retired now. I mean, mm. but anyway, I'm like, nope. And like, oh, you look like one of his lot. And I'm like, ah, yeah, you know, sure it happens all the time, ha ha. And um, I get shown, you know, where Jimmy Johnny's house is. I get to hear all about their holiday homes and where they live. And also where the old barracks are and the place that used to be a butcher's, but is now somebody's house. Like, I'm getting all the gossip. It's fantastic. I fucking love old people because they're funny and they give no shits. There was like a gang of them and they were brilliant. And just because I was there... They were like bringing me in on the jokes. I'm like, Mairead, you silly sausage. But it was a good time had by all. So I get to the airport and it's just, it's really busy. Because normally it's not that busy. There's a couple people going. It's a rural airport. There's not usually that many people there. And I'm like, oh geez, it's busy today. And the woman at the checkout desk is like, yeah, lots of Garth Brooks fans. Because I forgot that Garth Brooks was playing in Dublin. And so it was me and a ton of country western fans travelling down. So first the flight gets delayed and it's like it's only going to be half an hour. Ends up being an hour and a half. So I land in Dublin. I'm running late so I missed the bus I was supposed to get. Managed to get another bus which is... Not as slow as I was anticipating it to be because the way the bus service explains the times, it like tells you the time to the last stop on the destination, but not your stop. 
So I got a bit, it's fine. I made it work. Don't worry about it. So I get there, I land down. I'm like, shit, I'm not going to have time to do my hair and makeup. So I'm on the bus, like, smothering on, like, oil and moisturiser and primer. Like, I'm doing all the priming and getting, making sure that's done. I get to the hotel, check in. Beautiful hotel, by the way. Fucking gorgeous. Totally worth the 230 euro. I would do it again. So I show up. I'm chatting to the concierge. And he's asking if I'm going to go to Garth Brooks. And I was like, oh no, I've got an event on, but it's fine. And he's like, oh, he will miss you. I was like, oh yeah, of course he will. He's going to go, where's that weird haired girl? She should be here. So he laughs, I laugh, you know, whatever. And I check in, I take my keys, I'm about to go. And oh yeah, it was Mademoiselle. And I'm like, I turn around and he's handing me champagne. <laughs> and I was like, merci. And so he tries to speak French to me. Um, and I'm like, oh dear. Yeah, he's like, parlez-vous français? And I'm like, uh -huh. non. <laughs> non, je ne parle pas français. Je suis désolée, mon français est très mauvais. And it was just, it was fun. So anyway, go to my room. I'm drinking my champagne. I'm putting my makeup on. I'm doing my hair. I end up putting my hair in a scrunchie. Because this just feels like the most appropriate way to do it. So I've got my pyjamas on, i got my pink sweatshoes, and I'm ready. Press on nails, i got the press on nails. <laughs> and off I go, alone to this event, and I show up and there's people outside taking photos and I'm like, fuck, I'm here alone. I literally know no one. And the realisation hits me that I am surrounded by like actual professional people or as one person during the night called it a room full of people who don't shut the fuck up so there's me and you've got like radio DJs and television people like there are legit actual like professionals there and then you get someone like me showing up like hello <laughs> I am here um, I've got a TikTok it's doing pretty well so I show up and I see this woman and she is in this fuchsia, cerise, cerise fuchsia, this bright pink suit with a feather trim and, I'm, and, and a clear pink, it's clear and pink and a plastic. It's this bag, it's, it's really cool, it, it's awesome. And I'm just like, hi, <laughs> hello, I like you, you're cool. I love everything about this. And then there is this woman with yellow hair and an orange dress that kind of looks like a loofah. And, and at one point, I'm just talking about my pyjamas, right? And I'm saying about how there was a point where I didn't know whether I was actually going to be able to get a hotel. And worst case scenario, and worst case scenario, I was just going to go straight to the fucking airport and, and my PJs and just stay there. But I got myself sorted. It was fine. And I'm chatting to Murder Most Irish. And... They were so sweet. They were like, did you find somewhere to stay? Because, you know, you can always come crash with us. Not in a weird way, which was fucking love that they were like, not in a weird way. And it was really sweet and really kind. And I was, I was just, it was really nice. Like, you don't have to do that. And I love the fact that I made a nice enough impression. And also that I don't seem like a murderer, which is good. Because, you know. It's kind of what they deal with. They can see the signs. And it was just a good night. It was really fucking sweet. I loved it. So I ended up spending most of my time with like real life ghost stories, murder most Irish, this paranormal life and living room science. And honestly, best time. Uh, it, I've, I'll post some stuff up on the Instagram because I had a good time. It was great. So we're one of the last people to like leave the building and... All the goodie bags are gone and all they've got left is fake tan. Now, I don't know if any of you out for like look at my Instagram or my TikTok and you see my face, but I am an unnatural shade of pale. I don't do the tan thing. It just doesn't work for me. So I was like, oh, thanks. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. 
And I gave it to somebody who actually used tan, which seems like the more reasonable choice. So afterwards I was like, do I go out? Do I want to go like drinking and partying with all these super cool, awesome people? But uh, I decided to be responsible because I knew I had a flight early enough the next day. I knew I was going to have to leave early. So I was like, no, I'm going to go home. I said, go home. I'm going to go back to the hotel and go to bed. Have a shower. Like, just chill out. Change into a different pair of pyjamas and go to bed. And that's what I did. Um, Because that's what someone in their 30s does. (laughs) I guess my friend was like, yeah, that sounds exactly like someone who's in their 30s would do. It's like, yep, that's me. I'm old now. I'm the crypt keeper. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, quit your jibber jabber and fact me. And fact you, I will. But first, we've got to get our source on. Our sources are Home Office Records in the British Government's National Archives in Kew, Wild's Last Stand by Philip Hoare, Salome's Last Veil by Michael Kettle, 20th Century Sexuality by Angus McLaren. My Life and Dancing by Maud Allen, The Verbatim Report of the Trial of No Pemberton Billing MP on a Charge of Common Libel. We also have newspapers of the era including The Times, The Pall Mall Gazette, The Imperialist and The Vigilante. And finally, Modern Women on Trial by Lucy Bland. Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then let's begin. That is, of course, if you are ready to hear about the case of the cult of the clitoris. I cannot tell you how happy I am to finally talk about this because this is one of those like pieces of history that's like overlooked and ignored and not well known and this is one of those things that I think really should have its own three-part mini-series. Um, so if you are a TV executive, um, hi, I'm available to be the resident historian on these things. Thank you very much. Also, the fact that I do not have my own documentary series on the television is a disgrace, by the way, just saying. But this, the case of the cult of the clitoris, also the Battle of Castle Itar, which is just a farce in real life. And of course, the life of Julie Daubigny, La Mapin, the bisexual, cross-dressing, sword-dueling opera singer. Now... All of these deserve their own three-part miniseries. I mean, you could also do documentaries, it's fine, but they all deserve them and you should totally hire me. But yes, one of the reasons I started this podcast was to talk about the stuff in history that I found interesting or pieces that I wanted to share. And this is one of those things. And this itself revolves around shitty men, their refusal to acknowledge the concept of female desire, and puritanical misogynist bullshit. All because of a popular dancer and a homophobic conspiracy theory. So in 1918, Britain, or uh, some Britons, I should say, believed that the cult of the clitoris was deliberately undermining the British war effort. The accusation being that Germany had these special female agents who were luring the wives of powerful British men into lesbian affairs and enlisting them in the cult of the clitoris. And all of this comes to a head in a libel trial, of all fucking things, involving a member of parliament, a possibly fictional princess, a barefoot dancer and a dead playwright. The barefoot dancer in question? The 44-year-old Canadian star of the day, Maud Allen. Originally born Ulla Maud Alma Durant, which, let's face it, a wee bit of a mouthful. But in fairness, her brother was also called William Henry Theodore Durant, because apparently as many names as possible. Listen, I don't know how expensive birth certificates are, but you really do not need to fill in every single space. Like, you're fine. You don't need to give your kids four names. You know, just a four name is fine if you just want to do that. If you really feel like having a middle name, great. But you don't you don't need you don't need all the names. You don't need all the names. But yeah. So when she's like six years old, 
her family, they moved to the States. Well, her dad's already there. He's in San Francisco and he's setting up shop. He moves when she's three. And once he's, you know, all set up, the family move with him. Turns out Maud's pretty good at piano. So she studies it growing up. And when she's like in her 20s, her mum sends her to Europe so that she can continue studying being a pianist. And even though they don't really have a lot of money technically, supposedly Maud's actual biological grandfather is funding a good chunk of this. See, Maud's mum was adopted and apparently this rather wealthy gentleman was her biological, you know, grandfather who provided the family with monetary support here and there. So Maud, she's in Germany, she's studying the piano and she's there for six weeks when her brother is arrested for the crime of the century. When he kills two women within nine days of each other at the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Now this is a massive deal. Maud is convinced that her brother is innocent. He is protesting his innocence. But there is a reason he is known as the Demon of the Belfry. Unsurprisingly, after this event, Maud changes her name. Now, in fairness, Eula Maud Alma Durand, not exactly the best stage name in the world. So it gets shortened to Maud Allen. Now, was it changed because she doesn't want to be associated with a double murderer? Or because it's a better stage name. Whom's to say? So she gives up piano playing and decides to take the stage as a dancer instead. And this is where the world starts to turn in her favour. By the time 1906 rolls around, she is making waves in Vienna and she is becoming very well known, performing as Salome based on a version of Oscar Wilde's play. For those of you who did not go to Sunday school, in the Bible, the Holy Bible, the one with Jesus in it. Salome is a princess who asks King Herod for the head of John the Baptist. She's also known for doing this dance of seven veils. And it's this dance that Maud is particularly famous for because she fashions the outfit herself and it is sheer and gauzy and beaded. It's luscious and her dance is seductive and sexy. It's a very sexy dance. And Maud, she very much has ownership of her body on stage. She's confident. And when she dances, it appears as if she's dancing for her own pleasure. You know, it's very much about her. So in this version of um, Salome, when she has to dance with the head of John the Baptist on a silver plate, the whole presenting it on a silver platter, yeah, it's, it's based on that. So she does this, but in Oscar Wilde's version, she kisses the head of John the Baptist, which really leans into like the evils of women and female sexuality, etc, etc. Maud Allen ends up performing all over Europe. She goes across the world and she is more famous than Isadora Duncan, who some of you may know as the woman with the really fucking long scarf who got caught in the back of a car and it choked her to death. She was more famous than her. The best part for me about this is the fact that Maud Allen is not a trained dancer. Like, she doesn't have the same skill of someone like Isadora Duncan. She is not a professional dancer, yet she is dancing professionally. But this production of The Vision of Salome was fantastic because they really leaned into everything. It had shock value, it had sensuality. So she was like barely dressed. She was effectively topless, but covered in beads and jewels so that she looked, well, technically covered. She was technically covered up, free of the nipple. Because as a musician who became a dancer, she saw her body as an instrument and felt that it wasn't appropriate for her body to be covered up. Especially considering the fact that she started dancing at 30 and age then compared to age now is very different, or concept of it anyway. So being a 30 year old woman dancing in that manner, like that's, that's fantastic. I fucking love it. So 
she's practically naked in the eyes of 1900 society. So not only that, but they've got this waxwork realistic head of John the Baptist that they bring out. So it's really known for being like gory and shocking and it's, you know, it's a whole thing. So she's having a great fucking time. She's traveling all across Europe. She even goes to Russia. So she's performing in Paris and Bohemia, Munich, Budapest, Prague. She goes to Moscow and St. Petersburg, performs for the Tsar and the Tsarina. And like in Russia, they're more into like the technical stuff of it. So because she was not, you know, a professional dancer, because it was more about how she felt in the movement as opposed to the technical um, skills of dance, the, the, the reviews weren't great. But after Russia, she ends up doing a tour of the States. But before she gets there, this other dancer had come over and like watched the show, gone back to the States and then performed it there, resulting in it being banned in a bunch of places. So when Maud Allen goes to the States to perform, people are like chomping at the bit because they're wondering why the fuck has this been banned? So it creates more excitement and greater publicity for Maud Allen. So it really worked in her favour. Then she really goes global. Like she is in Australia, India, Africa. Like she is everywhere. She ends up going back to the States and then she's in a couple of like silent movies. So after performing in some silent movies, she decides she's going to go on tour again. But she hires like an orchestra and a bunch of other dancers. And effectively the tour starts, but then collapses because, you know, lack of money. And things aren't looking too good for her. But in 1918, the war, the Great War, World War I, is still fucking raging on. And there is nothing people like more during horrific times than entertainment. Luckily for her, she's an entertainer. The 44-year-old dancer is looking for work. And in a crazy random happenstance, Oscar Wilde's friends are looking to bring his work back into sort of public view because they have been unceremoniously banned. After his massive trial and public outcry, but he's been dead several years and his friends are trying to bring his name back in some sort of, hopefully out of the realms of infamy. And Maud is still very, very famous, or at the very least, quite notorious. So she agrees to come back, but it's not for a like public show. It is a private show, a private performance, because not only are Oscar Wilde's works banned, but there were very, very strict rules about religious figures being portrayed on the stage. So it was very much a fine line for this performance. But again, because this was not a public sort of display, because it was a private showing and it had to be paid for and booked in advance, you had to request it, like you had to write a letter and request admission and be a patron of this particular theatre, so members only, which made it just about okay. So when the play is advertised in early 1918 with Maud Allen as the star, something else is kind of going on within politics in Britain, it's because on the 6th of February, the Representation of People Act is passed. And this basically means women over 30 who had like property and money could vote. So a wee bit of women's suffrage. Not much, but a wee bit. So this is passed. And then Noel Pemberton Billing writes this scathing article, which was basically an attack on this one woman, not just Maud Allen, but everything Maud Allen represents because she's a single woman who has her own income, who has her own life that doesn't revolve around um, the man being a necessity, you know? This is not the first dodgy article this man has ever written, uh, so let me tell you a little bit about Pemberton Billing. So Noel Pemberton Billing was a British MP, a Member of Parliament, and he was an independent, so he wasn't aligned with like conservatives or labor, yada yada. He was just an independent. And he had been trained as a barrister, so like a lawyer, 
he was once, at one point, an actor. So I'm feeling there may be a wee bit of jealousy going on, but that's neither here nor there. Mm -mm. He was an aviator and an inventor and, of course, an absolute dick. It's like taking the worst qualities of Joe Rogan and Andrew Tate. I know what you're thinking. Do they have good qualities? Maybe. I've never seen them. But the point is, it's like taking them, throwing them back into a 1918 body with the sensibilities and shit standards of the time and just being the worst possible version of what a man could be. A year after being elected, he founds this vigilante society. Promote, and I shit you not, the purity in public life and to <laughs> discover and destroy the mysterious influence which was undermining the British war effort. The mysterious influence is um, Germany's influence, apparently. So he is hell bent on this. It's his own personal sad man crusade. With such charming slogans like Hinder the Huns, Paralyze Profiteers, Purify Politics, Win the War. Now, some of that some of that's not so bad, like win the war. Pure purify politics isn't the worst. But together Together it just makes you sound like an absolute tosspot. See, not only is this man a raging misogynist, he's also a fucking fascist, he's xenophobic and racist and anti-Semitic. I mean, are we really surprised at the rich white man who's very into purity and shit? Ew. Is in this way? No, we're not fucking surprised at all. And for a couple of years, he really seems to have this massive fucking issue with Maud Allen specifically. Like, he is gunning for her. And so he publishes this article in his newspaper, The Vigilante. I, I say newspaper. It is not worthy of wiping your arse with. It is right-wing, fascist, just absolute propaganda, popularist bullshit. It is fucking awful. And they publish this article called The Cult of the Clitoris. And it's written by, um, I think, Howard Spencer. I think it's Howard Spencer. Who had been discharged from the British Army for insanity. And this trashy piss rag of a paper heavily implies that Maud Allen is a lesbian. Although not illegal, was scandalous. You see, same-sex relationships for women were never held in the same way that they were for, like, men male same-sex relationships so where male homosexuality was just banned women loving women was not because they didn't believe it was real and they thought that women would be manipulated into how no i'm explaining this poorly you see it was basically like schrodinger's sexuality it existed and didn't exist simultaneously so the general consensus was that lesbianism didn't exist because women were not seen as individuals. They were not seen as sexual beings who had agency and their own desires. But they were also seen as deviants if they had said desires. To having desires is one thing and then expressing those desires is just a fucking catastrophe. Which brings us to the juxtaposition at the centre of womanhood. Because women are not only these incredibly sly and sneaky and deceitful deviants. They're also innocent and ignorant and easily manipulated and foolish and everything that goes along with that. So they were worried that if they stated that lesbianism was a thing, if lesbianism was banned... It would become this big gay domino effect. So because women would learn what lesbianism is, they would then turn gay and start being lesbian, doing lesbian things. Like, 
they would be so easily manipulated by the concept of lesbians that they would just fall into the fashion of it you know it would be like the end thing and that's what they were worried would would happen so it kind of existed to them but also didn't exist to them it's like this weird this weird thing so not only does this article basically accuse her of being a lesbian but it also accuses Maud Allen of having an affair a lesbian affair with the ex prime minister's wife Margot Asquith See, Margot is a woman who does not suffer fools lightly. So, underneath this article of the Cult of the Clitoris, there's an article on Margot Asquith. Now, she was the second wife of Herbert Asquith, the previous Prime Minister. And he was widowed and they got married and she's like quick-witted, she's smart. She moved around in intellectual circles. She was strong-willed, she was opinionated, she did not back the fuck down. And all of those sort of characteristics in her made her the opposite of the traditional concept of British femininity, you know? And what was acceptable to people like Pemberton Billing. So under the Cult of Clitoris article, there is Margot and the Snipers basically saying that she's colluding with the Germans and that she is going to be the equivalent of the previous French Prime Minister's, like, wife, who um, shot dead a journalist because he wrote, like, dodgy shit about her husband. She's seen as a sleek it, sneaky, treacherous fucking bitch. Like, that is the opinion that this vigilante paper has of her. And the whole purpose of these articles was for a libel case to come about. Like, they wanted someone to accuse them of libel because they are obsessed with this 47,000 conspiracy. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. So... For a good while, the the Vigilante and whatever the previous version of this journal was called, they were publishing these stories about this black book owned by Germany. And the black book had the name of 47,000 homosexual people in it. Ah yes, what a completely reasonable and not at all insane idea that a country has a secret but not so secret big book of gays that it's going to use to destroy you. And because homosexuality, specifically male-on-male relationships, was illegal in Britain at the time, and it was very controversial, very socially uh, destructive, and for a woman, especially of the time, even fucking now, (laughs) because patriarchy sucks, that if your reputation was ruined, your life was basically over. Like, you... You were unsavable. You were destroyed, tarnished, unworthy. And their absolutely not bonkers theory was that Germans were putting pressure on these people and because they had, you know, the big book of gays, that they would release this information and just fucking ruin lives just all over the shop. And so people were pressured into working with the Germans to undermine the British war effort. 
Like at one point, blaming gay people just isn't enough, and they, you know, they sprinkle in some anti-Semitism. And so they accuse Jewish gay people um, as if it's some kind of gay Jewish agenda. The real gay agenda. Uh-huh. Of deliberately spreading venereal diseases throughout, like, the British and Allied troops in order to, well, fuck up the war effort, disease all the soldiers and get them sent off the battlefield, and thus win the war. So not only did they think gay Jews were infiltrating the British army, seducing soldiers and spreading syphilis and gonorrhea, they were also accusing lesbians of infiltrating the British government via politicians' wives. And because they believed all of these things to be true, they wanted a libel case so that they could, you know, help promote it and push it and just really get into this. And the thing is, if Maud Allen wasn't suing them for libel, Margot Asquith probably would, because she'd done it before. She had been libeled for treason. Treason. At least twice. So at one point, um, she's accused of taking presents to German prisoners of war and of being an integral part of the plot to kill Kitchener by sending secret signals to the submarine that sunk him. The funny thing was, like, Margot won her cases. Like, I mean, if she was accused of treason, bad things would have happened. But she was able to prove that it was all fucking bullshit, right? But Maud Allen's like, fuck this for a game of soldiers. I'm, I'm contesting this. I'm being libeled. So when Maud Allen brings forth this libel case, he is ready, Billing is ready with a plea of justification. Because of course he does this smarmy piece of shit. He says it's not defamation because it's true. He says that Maud Allen was a lewd, unchaste and immoral woman who was about to give private performances of an obscene and indecent character which finally were designed to foster and encourage obscene and unnatural practices amongst women. Because he's a misogynistic piece of shit. So she has brought this libel case against him. He is the defendant, right? And what happens is, during this trial, Maud Allen seems to be the one who's on trial, right? Because of course it is, because this is a woman who lives alone, who does not fall within the pathetic, shitty standards of the time, who is living her best life and is doing rather well for herself. She also has the misfortune of not being British and because she had spent some time in Germany, that also made her like dodgy. And then you throw in the fact that she's playing Salome, which, although I think is Turkish, I think technically, it's still seen as an other. And it's, you know, it's just old British racism with its roots deep buried in. And it's Maud who really deals with, like, the shit. So the entire first day of the trial is Billings basically cross-examining her. And you're thinking, why is he cross-examining her? Because he is that arsehole who defends himself. He is his own barrister. He is his own lawyer. He is... He's in his own defence. I mean, luckily enough, he did actually train as a barrister. So it's not that shitty. You know, it's not... I mean, it's still narcissistic. But it's not as bad as someone who's had no legal training whatsoever who thinks they can defend themselves. So he's talking shit about Maud Allen and... The thing that really turns the case against her, apart from the fact that she is a woman who exists because she understood the libelous claims against her. Because she knew what the libel was, she was guilty of the the fucking shit they accused her of, which is so ridiculous. And to top it all off, it is very fucking clear that there were two people on trial and neither of them is Noel Pemberton Billing. Even though he is the defendant, and he is the one who should be on trial, it is very much Maud Allen 
and Margot Asquith that are being dragged through this. So right, back in that article which had the 47,000 big book of gay people owned by Germany, whatever, it mentioned lesbian ecstasy in which the most sacred secrets of state were betrayed. And it's all referencing Margot Asquith. And it keeps leaning into and playing with this rumour, this gossip that's been going around for years, that Margot Asquith was a lesbian. I mean, she could have been bi, she might have been a lesbian, but a lot of it seems to stem from the fact that she was naturally wealthy. She was born into wealth, but we're not going to hold this against her this one time. Because she's a funny fucker and she pisses this bitch off. Margot was independently wealthy, she was really fucking clever, and she was modern. She was a modern woman. She had modern standards. And she gave a shit about herself. Like, she didn't fall into the concept of British femininity and what womanhood was. I keep ranting about this, but it's true. She was also a bit of a dick, but again, she was really funny. But she was also really generous. And because she just gifted things to her friends and she helped other women, this also made her, like, a target. But back to the case. When Maud Allen appears in court, she really plays up to that concept of femininity. So she dresses in, like, a blouse, which is a wee bit too low. And she's got a cloak and a nice wee hat, right? She's, she's dressed well. And she's gone there because she's accused of being a lesbian. She wants to look more womanly as opposed to more masculine. And there she sits in the Old Bailey after bringing forth a libel case as she fucking should. Because she saw this as a challenge to her honour and her respectability, her social standing. Like, this could fuck her entire life up. Like, these kind of statements, this gossip, this absolute tomfuckery could just destroy her entire life. So she's at the Old Bailey and she admits that she understood the libel on site. She read it, she knew what it meant and she wasn't happy with the implication. Then Billing asks her if she is well acquainted with the term clitoris. And she's like, not particularly. And on top of this, it is made very clear that she did not have to explain, you know, the libel to her friends. Like, they also understood its meaning. So because she and her friends knew A, what the clitoris was, and B, what lesbians are, this, this is really where the shit hits the fan for Maud. And in one of the most pathetic gotchas in history, Billing turns around and he states that he showed the libel, the cult of clitoris, to 24 men. And out of these 24 men, only one understood its meaning. I mean, are we really surprised? No. No, we're not. So then Billing brings forth his chief medical witness onto the stand. And this, this part's incredibly worrying. So Dr. Cyril Cook, Cyril, not Cyril, Cyril, he showed the libel to 50 or 60 of his friends. He doesn't have an exact number. But he shows the libel to 50 or 60 of his friends and none of them understand. None of them know what it is. Zero. Zilch. Nada. This is a medical professional who, one would assume, is acquainted with other medical professionals. And none of them know what a clitoris is. I mean, I know, I know it's the 1900s, right? But still. And then Billing brings in Captain Spencer. 
because he's the one who wrote, you know, the actual piece. He's the one who wrote the headline. And he was asked why he chose this specific phrase. And Spencer says that he had contacted a village doctor who gave him the term clitoris and told him the clitoris is a superficial organ that when unduly excited or overdeveloped possess the most dreadful influence on any woman that she should do the most extraordinary things. An exaggerated clitoris might drive women to an elephant. Okay, somebody's got confidence issues. So we've got Dr. Cook who says that nobody but a medical man or people interested in that kind of thing would understand the term clitoris. So then you've got this other doctor, Dr. Clark, who's asked, is there any other person that would understand the term clitoris? And he's like, hmm, lesbians? And it's so fucking weird that this entire thing boils down to understanding clitoris. So not knowing the word meant that you were ignorant and you weren't like a pervert, basically. But by knowing the term and not being a medical professional, this meant that you were some kind of sexual deviant? Like that's, that's what this is. Another thing which really, really fucked up everything for Maud was her brother. So because her brother, as we know, had killed those two young women, she was seen as a hereditary deviant, an unfortunate hereditary deviant, but a hereditary deviant nonetheless. So because her brother did an awful thing, clearly she too must be awful. Like that is, that is what they're going with here. Like they both have to be the same. And because of her brother's crime, Maud is labelled a sadist. A sadist. Because of something her brother did. What the fuck? And then of course we have Salome, the, the play that she's performing. And the fact that it's very much seen as deviant and criminal and dodgy as fuck. And Maud's response to it all is basically that it's different times. What would have been seen as sort of not the done thing now, back then, in that era, in that culture, this wouldn't have been as shocking to like to Salome, like seeing the, the severed head. It wouldn't be as weird to her because this would have been something she would have known throughout her life. And the fact that she's not only standing up for the character and its existence, because she's standing up for something which is so far away from Britishness, like, this again makes her the other in all of this. Oh, bollocks, I almost forgot the agent provocateur. Okay, so there's this woman, um, Eileen. Yeah, I know, the sexiest name for a provocateur. So she's sent by Lloyd George to compromise Billing. Like, she's supposed to seduce him and fuck him up, basically, to get some dirt on him. And unfortunately, somehow, she falls in love with this man? For, uh, okay. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've seen dish rags with a more sexy appeal, but that's... It was the olden days. It was a different time and people found creepy and misogynistic pieces of shit absolutely attractive, apparently. So she falls for him and she defects, effectively, and she goes up in court and talks about this black book, the 47,000 names in the black book. And you've got her and Spencer who are claiming to have seen it but won't show it to anybody. Like apparently one of it, one of them was shown it by the Prince of Albania. But like it always seems to be just out with their grasp, but they can't show anybody else it. But it's real. It's definitely there. So they're asked about um like the names that were in the book. And Spencer, again, the man who was discharged from the British Army for insanity, he says that he will only give the names of 
who he thinks has been approached and succumbed to German agents. I will only give the names to those I think have been approached and have succumbed to German agents. Let's just think about that for a wee second. He will only give the names of people who he thinks have been approached and succumbed by German agents. Not the names of people he knows. But just a guess, because what's a livelihood or two? Fuck it. It's fine. So he names Margot Asquith and Lord Haldane. He does not remember, conveniently, Mr. Asquith's name being in the book, Herbert. That's not there. But just Margot. So, again, Eileen, she's like, I saw it too. Those names were definitely in the book. Pinky promise and stuff. Yeah. So the judge on the case, he he says that, you know, any information about this book is inadmissible in court unless you physically show us the book. But nobody shows him the book. And then they go on to discuss this book at length, in detail, consistently, over the course of this trial. Like at one point, Eileen says that the judge is in the book. And he's like, get out of my court. And she's like, no. (laughs) It is, it's, it's, it's something. It's definitely something. But like before the jury, you know, is supposed to make the decision, the judge tells them, you can't, you can't use any references to this book. There's 47,000 names. Like, that can't be part of your decision. And then, when Billing addresses the jury, all he does is talk about, like, Germany and German influence was infiltrating Britain and trying to take it down from the inside. Like, man, have a cup of tea. Sit down. God, and have sex with someone. I don't, who's consenting. Like, what? Get a fucking hobby. So one of Maud Allen's lawyers, he does the closing argument and he goes on about how the stuff about the 47,000 names uh, doesn't really matter and that Pemberton Belling never proved his plea for justification and that all he wanted was publicity and that's what you gave him and in doing so he's attempting to destroy this woman. Don't do that. That's bad. And this all-male jury, they go back, they deliberate, And when they return, they find Noel Pemberton Billing, accused of libel, is not guilty. And the crowd goes wild. Like people are just throwing hats in the air and cheering and, you know, apparently calling a woman a lesbian and a sadist and a German spy without any evidence... Totally cool in the 1900s. Absolutely fantastic. This toenail of a man got to go out in public and actively defame a woman by calling her a German-loving, sadistic pervert and faced no repercussions. All because her femininity was undesirable. Because it was that of a modern woman. So... Several months later, Eileen, his mistress, she is convicted of bigamy and she breaks down and confesses that everything she said on the trial was bullshit. She'd made it up. It had been rehearsed with billing. They had practiced it beforehand so that she should come on and dance little monkey dance. And for Maud Allen, as a result of this case... Her European career just fizzles out. Just, she's seen as this dodgy, deviant, like, evil woman. So, she gives up on Europe and then she goes back to the States. 
And for Pemberton Billing, by 1921, he ends up um, just resigning from his seat instead of losing it. So eventually all that, you know, shouting into the abyss, it gives up. So three years later, he has to give up his seat because it's seen as more respectable than losing it to someone else. And there you go. That is the story of the case of the cult of clitoris. Now, what did we learn today? We learned that any concept or expression of womanhood that does not fall specifically within the male gaze will always be seen as other or deviant. We also learned that within the case of the cult of the clitoris, that the truth, not unlike the clitoris, was incredibly difficult, nigh impossible, for men to find. If you liked my telling of this tale, feel free to rate and review five stars. Absolutely. Do a review. Say some nice things. Say some mean things. Tell me about your favourite pyjamas. Why not live your best life? And you can follow me on all of the social medias. I am on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and Twitter. You know, chat to me on Twitter because I will talk back. I am that person. If you message me, and if you message me, if you tweet me, I'll respond, because I will. It may take me a few hours, because I'm at work, and also I'm in a lot of pain, but I'll get back to you. So today's episode is dedicated to Emma Irizari. Irizari? Irizari? Itzari? I, you know what, Emma, you know I tried, and I think that's what matters, because I wasn't... I don't know what nationality that your um, surname comes from, so I couldn't even hazard a guess, to be honest. Um, But I tried, and this episode is dedicated to you. You're welcome. You got you got a good one. <laughs> what episode did you get dedicated? Um, It's fine. I don't need to say it out loud. It's, it's okay. <laughs> so um, before I go, I, it's, it's recommendation time. So... I want to recommend Murder Most Irish. That's for listening. I was traveling back from Dublin and I listened to like so, so many episodes. Emma, Sarah Jane, Colin, they're just absolute delights. I fucking love them. They are, they're just, they're fun and they're irreverent and witty and it's just, and it's crime, which is nice. So it's good, and it's Irish crime. So if you like that, or crimes in Ireland, also, maybe, yes. Just check them out, they're really good. For watching, oh, House of the Dragon. Listen, I'm into it, I like it. You can judge me if you want, that's fine. But I'm enjoying it, go watch it. And for reading, I am reading currently. I just started reading. I'm glad that my mum died by um, Jeanette McCurdy. It's finally here. So, I, oh yeah, before I go, so I opened up the box. I was like, oh look, mum, my new book's here. And my mother gave me such side eye. Like, <laughs> probably not the best book to sort of wave gleefully at your mother. Yep, not, not a good idea, not the best idea. But it is a good read. It is heart-wrenching but it's really good it's really good so that's it that's everything and i shall bid you good night adios au revoir of wit as my friends bye bye